Today's episode is brought to you by We Break You Buy. Interested in sports cards and memorabilia? Check out We Break You Buy on TikTok. We Break You Buy is a small operation run by three brothers, offering spots for a chance at winning some incredible sports cards and memorabilia. That's We Break You Buy. Check it out today on TikTok. And I'm your co-host, Anton Paras. And we have a return guest who listeners will recall being on the show very recently. Ryan Moran, welcome back. Welcome back, Ryan. Thank you for having me again, both. Happy to be here. I know you're thrilled to be here. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Anytime we can have a nice conversation about a film, I'm, I'm down. That's the spirit. That's the Christmas spirit. Yes, I'm, it is. Christmas and... spirit is in full effect. Yes. Yeah, no, gr- no Grinches here. Am I right? Mm, I don't think so. Perhaps a Grinch whose heart grew a couple sizes recently? Mm, Perhaps. I thought I saw a certain specter over your shoulder. (laughs) (laughs) Or something. I don't remember the line exactly. I think that's it. That was it. Uh, Trust me, that was it. And then don't forget to throw the evil eye hand gestures right back at him. (laughs) Turn on the underwater landing lights. (laughs) We are here, to, of course, to talk about our first James Bond movie of the season, Thunderball. You know, we haven't covered a Bond movie in quite some time, Anton. It was not yeah. towards the end of last season when we, when we thankfully wrapped up the Daniel Craig era with yeah, no that, time to die. And that was a fun time going through all of the Daniel Craig films. And Pat, we were before we were recording, it was a really good reflection that our listeners haven't had a chance to hear us talk about Bond in the Golden Age. So excited to be here. Yeah, it's time to talk some Golden Age Bond. We're going to yeah. wind the clocks back to 1965. Christmas 1965, actually, is, is when this particular film was released. And a little disclaimer for the listeners. Uh, we're recording this before Christmas, but you're going to hear this after Christmas. So we hope that everyone... Had a very Merry Christmas for those who celebrate it. And those who don't, we hope you had fun on December 25th anyway. Right. Hope that you're enjoying the holiday season. Um, For those celebrating Christmas, hopefully you gave someone that you care about a gift that they'll enjoy. And maybe you got something fun. And, well, you'll always get the gift of why wasn't it better on a weekly basis. That's right. Or in this case, three episodes in one week because the episode that was released on Christmas Day was Eyes Wide Shut. That was our gift to the world. What do you know? We're always, we just want to bring all these gifts to the people. That's right. Today's episode is going to be uh, the first part of a double header. This is really not something that we've done before, but we are deciding to cover uh, today, obviously, Thunderball. And then the next episode is going to be the unofficial remake of Thunderball, Never Say Never Again. So, you know, we understand that not all the listeners choose to listen to the episodes in order, and normally that's fine. You don't have to. But in this particular case, we would highly recommend listening to this one before you listen to Never Say Never Again. Although, if you're listening to me say this right now, you're either doing what I'm suggesting or it's too late, in which case just keep listening. <laughs> so basically, just do what you want. Yeah, that's probably the best way of saying it, Anton. Thank you for uh, bailing me out of that one. Perfectly put. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, of course, um, welcome back. It's been a very short time since we last heard from you when you were here to defend How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and you did a wonderful job of doing so. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate that. And I, yes, although it's been a short time, uh, I, I've missed you both greatly. So happy to be back. The feeling is mutual. Yes. We're, we're excited to have you. We were, we were happy to, of course, uh, do our typical plugs for every guest but was there anything extra you'd like like to mention um on the platform um as always uh with being a guest on the show i'm gonna i'm gonna go plug free today plug free today all right 
Yeah, Anton, I I wanted to get a little admin out of the way. There's been some updates regarding the state of the Bond franchise, or should we say lack of updates? There is a a reality show. With Logan Roy. Right, Logan Roy, Brian Cox. It's on Prime Video right now. I haven't seen it. I probably won't anytime soon. Reality shows aren't really my thing, but I'm sure many in the Bond community are watching that. But more importantly, Barbara Broccoli, who is the, of course, co-head of Eon Productions, along with her former stepbrother, Michael G. Wilson, um, she recently said in an interview that there is no hurry to make the next film, which really makes me sad as a Bond fan, because at this rate, we probably won't have another Bond film until like 2027. I really hate to say it, but I think the glory days might be over. I mean, it's tough to hear that there's going to be such a long wait. One can look at that statement and think, is this just a laziness, lack of urgency on the Broccoli's part to want to have another Bond film back? Or do they want to continue to stoke the fires of people wanting another Bond film, and but really at the same time, making sure that they get it right because you'll you'll agree both of you'll agree it's a pretty big decision when once they decide who bond will be like who which actor will be bond uh, i think it's laziness on their part i think they're out of ideas <laughs> are you well, sure i mean not oh, i'm sorry you know i'm not trying to be harsh but if you're passionate about doing something you do it you don't sit around and take years to do it. And I just want to give you a little perspective on this, Anton. So if if the next film releases in 2027, that would be a solid 15 years since the last decent film, Skyfall, and 20 years since the last great one, Casino Royale. Mm, been so a if bit you're bad. trying to stoke the fires and you know whip up the fan interest, it's a very strange way of going about it. Perhaps they're just really letting people just forget about No Time to Die, and they're giving it extra, extra cushion. Maybe. I I don't really know what they're doing. I I don't think they do either. I think they're sitting on a pile of money, and I just don't know how motivated they are to do this. And every year that they delay, they are, I don't want to say losing fans, but they are losing out on gaining more fans, particularly particularly among younger viewers. Does anyone under 30 really like James Bond at this point? I hope they do, but I don't know that they do. No, that's fair. I mean, well, got to say this, you know, you touched on Brian Cox, Logan Roy and the reality like TV game show on Prime for James Bond. I think, uh, well, it's pretty terrible so far. (laughs) So there's nothing else I can really add to that. Have you seen it? Yeah, I have. I I wanted to check it out. And now you wish you hadn't. I've been meaning to message you about it, but I figured, I don't know. It's really not great. That's all I wanted to say about the state of the Bond franchise. I, I, I hope we get another Bond soon. I'm always excited for another Bond movie. So, you know, I remain hopeful. That's all I can say. Can I make one last, I'll add one last statement before we um, fi- finish with the admin. Brian Cox actually agreed to do the reality show because the thought he thought it was part of the new James Bond series. <laughs> Not a reality mm, show. Foot in the door. I want to say he would make a great villain, but he's pretty old at this point. You know, typically you'd want a younger villain, but I don't know. I wouldn't count it out. 60s and the 60s work, right? That's true. Yeah, that's it for the admin. Anton, let's get into this. Under the supervision of Mastermind, Emilio Largo, the criminal organization called Spectre, hijacks two warheads from a NATO uh, plane and threatens widespread nuclear destruction to extort $100 million. The dashing agent 007, James Bond, is sent to recover the warheads from the heart of Largo's operation in the Bahamas, facing underwater attacks from sharks and men alike. He must also convince the enchanting Domino, Largo's mistress, to become a key ally. Released on December 22, 1965 by Eon Productions and United Artists, directed by Terrence Young, screenplay by Richard Maybaum and John Hopkins, based on the original story by Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and Ian Fleming, starring Sean Connery, Claudine Auger, Adolfo Seeley, Luciana Paluzzi, Rick Van Nutter, Martine Beswick, Molly Peters, and Bernard Lee. Budget at $9 million, which is $85 million adjusted for inflation. 
with a box office at $141 million, so $1.35 billion adjusted for inflation. Why, why was this movie chosen? Thunderball is the last of the golden age of James Bond. It is the last of the first four. It was preceded by Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger. These four Bonds stand out as being the, you know, the best of the so-called classic era of Bond in the 1960s. The film that followed this, You Only Live Twice, was notable for moving the series in a different, more whimsical, more grandiose direction. And it's absolutely something that we're going to be talking about in a future episode. But Thunderball is interesting because it was really the height of Bond mania during that time. You know, you just mentioned the box office numbers. This was adjusted for inflation, the highest grossing film in the franchise until Skyfall was released in 2012. This and Goldfinger are really what propelled the series into becoming a global phenomenon. And Sean Connery became one of the biggest stars in the world around this time. James Bond would continue to permeate popular culture more and more as the decades passed. But in terms of the financial peak of the series, Thunderball is it. I have so many fond memories of watching this on TV with my dad as a little kid. My dad, of course, is the one who got me into James Bond. And, and Thunderball was one of the ones that really fascinated me at a young age. I was probably four or five years old when I first saw this. And even though it was an older movie by the time I saw it, I, I was really blown away by it. I found the underwater scenes fascinating. Now, you, you may be asking, well, why are we covering it on the podcast? Despite the enormous box office numbers, this is one of the more polarizing films amongst Bond fans. There are a lot of people that love it, but there are a lot of people that rank it quite low. They find it boring. They find the, the underwater stuff tedious. And anything that is divisive amongst a fan base I think is fair game for us to cover. And of course, this in addition to the remake Never Say Never Again, which we're which we're covering on the next episode, it just made this, you know, um, doubly appealing. But I do want to ask our guest, Ryan, you know, I know that you are not a traditional Bond fan. Why did you want to talk about Thunderball? We've had a lot of conversations about Bond films and um I know we had spoken about the Daniel Craig era specifically and you had made mention like if you're really trying to get a true grasp of what the Bond series was and the pinnacle of it, go back to Sean Connery's days. And so when you asked me to be on this episode, I figured, you know what, this is going to give me the push I need uh, to get my schedule in order and actually sit down and watch these films. So I was super excited to see what the films had to offer and, and discuss it with you. Anton, do you have any history with Thunderball? So personal connection with Thunderball and I'll, and I'll share a, a very recent there was a rewatch I did in college and very closely there's of, of course the very famous backrest scene where Bond is of course uh, showing off his abilities to play the game with Largo I don't think as a kid when I watched it I really understood the in intricacies of the conversation how wonderful uh, they were able to really play that cat and mouse game while playing the game itself and watching it in college, I was just so fascinated and I didn't even know why Bond won over Largo. And it uh, influenced me to actually learn the game. I've played the game. It's fascinating because it's so simple, but great to see that it was used in the film. I think it was a much better decision to use this game versus what, of course, was used in Never Say Never Again. But in terms of personal history, that was just a fun little, fun little tidbit that I personally love. But of course, no one can deny the influence that Thunderball has, not just among Bond fans, but also on all popular culture. Baccarat. Yeah, interesting. I've only played it once. It's super simple. Uh, you don't see it in a lot of casinos. Well, no, every casino. I was going to say, the, the fun part is you don't typically see it on the, the regular or like just around like blackjack. You see a lot of blackjack. You see a lot of pie yeah. go poker. You don't see well nowadays. It's been getting more popular. You'll see it in the high in the high end high limit room. Yeah, that's the high roller stuff right there. Yeah, I think I think maybe what I should have said is a casual gambler like myself with a very limited gambling budget. It's it's not available. Like the last <laughs> time I was in Vegas, I had to really find a table at a casino that had you know a a, a reasonable minimum. 
yeah, like right. less than one hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a tough find in Vegas for sure. Yeah, it was basically mm-hmm. I had one option, and it was to play at like eight o'clock in the morning for a ten dollar yeah. minimum. So way off the strip. It was on the strip. It was at Aria. Okay. But, oh wow. Oh, again, this was a... eight o'clock in the morning, though. Yeah, yeah. true. True. <laughs> I mean. If if you're there at eight o'clock in the morning on the table, I'm curious if there were people that were there since eight p.m. in the evening from the previous night. It sure looked like it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's when a lot of people are going to bed. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the influence on popular culture, Anton, because so many things in this movie have been ripped off by so many different other IPs, including Bond. Of course, there are many um, future Bond movies that would have callbacks to this, and that's why I think this is one of the many reasons why this is an interesting one to revisit also just this film was basically the entire plot to the first austin powers movie yes uh yes. yeah let's hijack some nukes and hold the world hostage <laughs> they they copied everything it was i i guess i didn't ha- i knew that it was a play on bond when i watched austin powers but i had no idea how like everything was just on the nose from this it was hilarious everything was making me chuckle as i saw it i'll stay <laughs> I too like to live dangerously. What does he have? Like six? He's like, sir, you're on six. <laughs> yes. Yep. Number two hits on like nineteen or twenty. Yeah. And the guy, the dealer, warns him, and then Austin stays on six. I'm I sorry. Suggest- I thought you said you had a lot of. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, let's get into this. The production history. This is uh, a juicy production history, Anton. It's not going to come close to Cleopatra. There's no way of topping that, but. This is one of the more complicated makings of a movie. So let's talk about how Thunderball got made. There is a nonfiction book called The Battle for Bond, which is written by Robert Sellers. I'm going to give this a shout out on the the Never Say Never Again episode as well. It should be required reading for any serious James Bond fan. The book is actually out of print at the time of this podcast recording. You can, you know, you can find it on eBay and other places where you buy books. There's a ton of historical information on it that will never appear on any of Eon's official making of material for this film. There's a lot in the book that Eon would probably rather be forgotten. So going all the way back to the creation of this particular novel and film, Ian Fleming, of course, the the author who created James Bond, he had been publishing the Bond novel since 1953. He immediately sold the rights to his first novel, Casino Royale, which was adapted into an American TV movie in 1954. It was not particularly well received, so Fleming just continued to write the novels, which sold well. The background on Thunderball, it gets very dense. In 1958, Ian Fleming had published six Bond novels to great success, and he began to reconsider the possibility of a Bond movie. Casino Royale was, again, a TV movie. He was thinking about the big screen. Fleming was introduced to an Irish filmmaker named Kevin McClory, and the pair began working on a treatment for the very first Bond movie. A little later, McClory brought on his friend, a writer named Jack Whittingham, to work on the project as well. Over a year went by, and by which time Fleming began to grow disinterested and discreetly ended his involvement in the project. At one point, McClory thought they were close to approaching a film film studio with a finished script, but of course, Fleming had other ideas. And this is where it gets really weird. In the spring of 1960, Fleming began writing the novel Thunderball based on the screenplay that was written by himself, Whittingham, and McClory. But in what would prove to be just an amazingly stupid move on his part, neither McClory nor Whittingham received any credit for their work. And this decision would go unresolved for more than 40 years. In Fleming's slight defense, Kevin McClory was... Basically, a snake oil salesman who conned the author into believing that he could get a John, a James Bond movie made. He really presented himself as this Hollywood insider who knew a lot of producers, and the reality is he probably couldn't. Nobody in the film industry took him seriously or really wanted to work with him, but he was determined to hitch his wagon to James Bond. Nevertheless, Fleming really screwed up by not crediting him or winning him. Like this is entirely Fleming's fault that the, that what we're about to discuss happened. Shortly before the novel's publication in March 1961, McClory got his hands on an advanced copy and he was understandably outraged. He and Whittingham filed a plagiarism lawsuit against Fleming in the British High Court, attempting to stop the novel's publication. Now, the court ended up allowing the novel to be published, but 
the door was left open for McClory to pursue further legal action. Also in 1961, completely separate from this, producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman acquired the film rights to all of Fleming's novels, which included Thunderball. Broccoli and Saltzman originally wanted Thunderball to be the first Bond film, but they decided to go with Dr. No due to this unresolved legal matter they found out about after they had purchased the rights. So that's the only reason why Dr. No was the first Bond movie, and it was released in October of 1962. Broccoli and Saltzman founded Eon Productions, which continues to produce Bond films to this day. McClory took further legal action in November 1963. This had a negative effect on Fleming's health, and he suffered a heart attack during the trial. Now, by this point, Eon had just released the second Bond film, From Russia with Love. The trial lasted three weeks before Fleming, under advice from friends, settled out of court with McClory. McClory gained the film rights for the screenplay as well as the novel, while Fleming was given only the literary rights to the novel, although it has to be recognized as being based on a screen treatment by Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and the author. To expand on this a bit, if he wanted to make a movie, McClory now had the rights to use anything in the original screenplay as well as the novel. This included Spectre, Blofeld, and most crucially, the character James Bond and everything associated with Bond that appeared in the novel. In short, he had the right to make his own independent Bond movie if he wanted, as many times as he wanted, provided he drew from the original screenplay or the novel. Quote, the exclusive right to use the character James Bond as a character in any such script or film of Thunderbolt. End quote. This exact wording would later prove useful, especially if you had a good lawyer. And sadly, Fleming died of a fourth heart attack in August 1964. Goldfinger was released a couple months later to even greater success, and James Bond was now a global phenomenon. Goldfinger was intended to be the fo followed up with On Her Majesty's Secret Service. However, Broccoli and Saltzman, fearing McClory would produce a rival Bond movie, offered McClory a deal. He would let them adapt Thunderball and would be given sole credit as producer. Broccoli and Saltzman would be executive producers. A major part of the deal they made was that McClory had agreed to not make any future adaptation of the novel for a minimum of 10 years. Broccoli and Saltzman assumed that McClory would simply lose interest in pursuing it after such a lengthy period of time. In contrast to the legal battle, Thunderball enjoyed a relatively smooth production. Guy Hamilton, who had directed Goldfinger, declined to return, claiming exhaustion. So Terrence Young, who had directed the first two Bond films, was brought back. Terrence Young is one of the principal players in the initial success of the Bond film series. He worked so closely with Connery on Dr. No and helped him develop his look. He took him to his Savile Row tailor, made him sleep in his suits to get used to it, really helped him become Bond. Julie Christie was originally sought for the role of Domino, but after meeting her in person, Broccoli decided her breasts were too small and instead turned his attention to Raquel Welch. Unfortunately, Welch was contractually bound to appear in Fantastic Voyage and couldn't accept. Standards were different then. Or maybe they haven't changed? Uh, they're not as public, perhaps? There we go. Faye Dunaway came close to taking the role before former Miss France Claudine Auger was cast as Domino. Auger beat out 150 other candidates. Filming began in February 1965, most of which took place in the Bahamas. The film is widely remembered for its extensive underwater action sequences. 25% of it was filmed underwater, which had never been attempted before in a movie. This included 60 divers that participated in the climactic underwater battle. Production designer Ken Adam, whom we're going to consistently praise on this podcast, designed all the underwater vehicles that Largo's men use. One of the more underrated parts of this movie. All of that stuff had to be invented for the film. The budget ended up being bigger than the previous three films combined. And this is the production where the rift between Broccoli and Saltzman began to develop. The Aurelion on set at the same time. Uh, the book I read reveals that one of the biggest reasons they, they set up this Swiss-based holding company, Danjack, was that so neither one could withdraw large sums of cash from the corporation without the approval of the other. Now, while the production was largely drama-free, director Terrence Young ended up walking immediately after shooting ended, leaving the entire post-production process in the hands of editor Peter Hunt. It's worth pointing out that while you only live twice is cited as being an unhappy filming experience with Bond and one of the re main reasons why Connery left the role, the problems really began during the filming of Thunderball for Connery. 
He was on a multi-film contract, and despite the films making more and more money as they progressed, Broccoli and Saltzman refused to give him a raise. The other main gripe Connery had is that each subsequent film was taking longer and longer to produce, thus taking away from other film opportunities for the actor. In particular, Connery's relationship with Harry Saltzman really began to deteriorate. Saltzman was known as being the more cantankerous of the two producers. By the following film, the two of them were barely on speaking terms. And Connery recalled in the book that at one point there were 15 consecutive days where they worked from dusk till dawn. I have to say, Connery's complaints seem very reasonable to me. If the films were going to take longer and longer to shoot, why not give him a raise, especially when the money was only getting better with each? I can kind of understand his position. When he's the the face of the franchise at this point as well, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to give him a little bit of a bump when you're having great success with the films. And yeah, I, I think that's absolutely reasonable. If the films are taking longer, he should probably be compensated for that. Fast forward to the 2010s. With Daniel Craig, the producers really gave Craig a lot of creative input and decision-making power that, you know, no film star back in the 1960s would have ever been granted. So (laughs) it it is interesting just to see, um, just in this particular franchise, um, how much the relationship between producers and the lead uh, evolved. John Barry and lyricist Don Black ended up writing two title songs for the film. The original, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, sung by Dionne Warwick, was replaced with Thunderball, sung by Tom Jones, after United Artists insisted that the song include the film's title. Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang would not be publicly released until the 1990s. However, the melody of that song is present throughout the score. The film was released on Christmas 1965 and quickly became one of the most financially lucrative films of all time, and it still is. It is difficult to understate just how successful this was at the box office. And that's why, Anton, we always make a point to bring up the um, numbers adjusted for inflation. Right, absolutely. $140 million back then, $1.35 billion in today's money. But here's the real interesting part of it. 58 million Americans saw this film in theaters. That's, that was one-third the population of the United States at the time. It grossed $63 million in North America alone. That's more than half a billion dollars in today's money. So think about it like this. That's Titanic money. That's Dark Knight money. That's Avengers Endgame money. No Bond film has equaled this at the North American box office since. No, like not even Skyfall has come close to that. Right. And what's interesting also to consider is it wasn't even the highest grossing film of 1965. No, but, it wasn't even second. Right. It was, it was, in, it was number three. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Ryan, any guesses it? as yes. to what was first or second? Absolutely none. Number one well, was The Sound of Music. Okay. Number two was Dr. Zhivago. Ah, okay. Yeah. I You've heard of at least both. one of those. Yeah. I've heard of both of them. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, Big in the 60s, I guess. Ultimately, the battle with Kevin McClory would not be resolved until after his death in 2006 when Eon purchased the rights back from his estate. This is ultimately what opened the door for Blofeld to return in the series as Spectre, Inspector, which was released in 2015. That is it for the production. And all of our podcast listeners know how we thought of Spectre. So, yeah, you know what, Anton? I would like to do something. A first for this podcast. I would like to retroactively lower my grade of Spectre. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. I think D plus is generous. I'm downgrading it to a D minus. Wow. Not even, not even a half step down, a whole step. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's pretty close to being garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first. Second. That's right. That's right. Anton, you, you want to, what would you give it a D? Yeah, you gave it. Yeah, a, I did. Yeah, yeah I gave you, it a you, D. It a D. you want to lower it or you oh. keep it there? I'll keep it there. It's the holidays. I'm sure they've had enough. Uh, pe- pe- people have had enough uh, tough time with the economy. <laughs> <laughs> Adjusted for inflation. How many gallons of milk is that, by the way? <laughs> What's the price of a gallon of milk? I don't know. Who knows that? I, I do, unfortunately, all too well. What is it, six bucks? Yeah, easy. <laughs> six bucks for a gallon of milk. Jeez. Oh yeah, what's well, a, how much is a a bunch of bananas? How, or how much is a banana? Five dollars. Bananas are still reasonable. Yeah, bananas are in like the one dollar pound range. 
And if you shop at the Latino supermarket, it's like 70 cents a pound. Yeah. Well, so it depends if you're going organic or if you're going regular. Oh, the Latino supermarket doesn't have, they don't differentiate. Yeah. At well, least the one so- here doesn't. I don't know. <laughs> Bananas are still reasonable, thankfully. Yeah. Big, uh, big banana family here. You endorse, you endorse bananas on all, <laughs> all fronts. Yes, my my son is a is a big banana fan. He's it's constant. Like we take him to the grocery store, bananas are, are in the forefront of his mind. Perfect. Get that potassium young. Absolutely. Eat it's your very smart veg. of your son to pick something that's you know mod, you know modestly priced. Yes. Yeah. He's he's uh, very frugal. Yeah. Could be the opposite. <laughs> Imagine if like he was into caviar. <laughs> I'd, I'd almost be willing to pay the money just to say, yes, I have a three-year-old who is a caviar aficionado. <laughs> yeah, there's the... I, I had a friend who's who taught his son very young, like, we're, you know, we're going to expand your minds to try different kinds of foods. You're not going to be one of those kids that only eats chicken nuggets. But then what you end up having is an eight-year-old that really wants uh, uni uh, when they go to a Japanese restaurant. He said, that's just too expensive. Mm, that's a tough one yeah but but that is impressive to have a small child asking for uni is actually amazing yeah i'm 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 impressed beluga caviar and dom perignon 53 at what age nine yeah does it have to be chilled of of course yeah we can't drink warm champagne even if it's dom (laughs) oh my pro tip to all the listeners dom perignon is overpriced go for bollinger is that a plug that's a. I wish. Imagine if like Dom Perignon was a sponsor. <laughs> right up there with Omega. Oh yeah, it'd be great. Not anymore. You just you just bash them. It's pretty yeah. official, but Pat's always dropping life pro tips. But maybe we should start tracking Pat's pro tip for the episode. You could do that. Ooh. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, like a like a nice little side segment. I don't even remember the last one I gave though. So one of you has to go back and fill me in. I'll go. I'll go through. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, that was it for the production history of Thunderball. Let's talk about why wasn't it better. Number one, let's just get this out of the way, the, the treatment of women. There's no getting around it. This has maybe the rapiest moment in the entire series. Bond tries to forcibly kiss, nurse fearing, and then he later extorts her into having sex with him in the steam bath. It's pretty gross. Yeah, and it was probably perceived also as as weird back then as now and at least i like to hope so yeah, yeah kind of lost I, touch I, yeah it's <sighs> you, you like when you see bond like you know go in for every girl that he sniffs within 10 feet but they they just you know willingly accept uh, his embrace this was the first time you've seen a no and he doubles down and says hey uh <laughs> if you don't want to get fired we could just go into the steam bath over here yeah, I mean, and they later try to, like, sort of excuse it by showing how into him that she is, but that doesn't make it any better. No. Yeah, no, definitely not. Especially after he just got his uh, back broken on that machine, he still couldn't help himself. No, I have to say, um, I don't know if I have it in my lo- notes later on, but I, I was, like, fascinated by that machine and why it has a go-crazy mode. <laughs> <laughs> like, it just seems like... If it can kill you or rip you, I just why why have it? What is this machine? There's probably a reason it isn't around anymore. There was like four or five levels of danger too. It's just <laughs> like why why would you progressively get ramp up into that realm? What what is this? What is this for? It was for a very undignified scene for James Bond. Like there's just no way to make that look cool. It didn't look cool. I might be six inches taller. Yeah, nice to have met you, Mister Bond. <laughs> oh, that guy, Lippy. Oh, quick sidebar, Anton. So, you know the guy in this film, Count Lippy? Yes. So, that is technically the name of the guy who fights Bond in the clinic in Never Say Never Again. He's credited as Lippy in the end credits. They don't say his name in the film, obviously, but that's who that was. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. Ryan doesn't know what we're talking about because he hasn't seen that masterpiece of a movie yet. I have not, but I do know Miss Lippy, a popular character from the Adam Sandler films. There you go. Glad you brought that up because that's going to bring us into our second reason why this wasn't better. The pacing and the editing. I lied. It has nothing to do with that, but perfect segue. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, flawless. Perfect. Um, the plot to this film, I would say, is pretty straightforward. It, it, it does kind of plot along, but I'm always on the lookout for plot holes. I couldn't find a lot in here. This is a pretty linear plot. It's pretty easy to digest. 
It's not very complicated, but that's fine. We don't mind simple plots here on why wasn't it better, do we, Anton? Right. We do not, because from simplicity, we can create beauty. That's Yes, that's much better said than I did. I have one thing in mind that I found kind of like hard to digest was the, the Night of the Jabberwocky Festival. Um, <laughs> there, there was an awful, awful lot that went on. <laughs> I mean, between the the back and forth, the fighting, a um, little love making, but yet he still had time to go back to the uh, Jabberwocky Festival. It was I, I was confused how there was that much time in the night. How long did that satanic, um, beautiful ritual go on for? It just kind of confused me a little bit. You're talking about is it called the Junkanoo? Is that what it's called? Junkanoo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the Junkanoo. It's exactly what I said. The Jabberwocky. Right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I'm assuming it just unfolded all night. That's kind of how I interpreted it. But yeah, it, it was just it was dark when we started with it, right? And then he left to go uh, save his uh, third mistress uh, of the film, or, or maybe the first one. I, I don't know. Um, and then by the time that was all done, he goes back to the room, and then he hangs out with his second mit- mistress, has a good time, and then he still has time to go back to the uh, festival. There was just a lot going on. There was. A lot of juggling, a lot of multitasking from Bond, but that's why he's a double O agent. He can do all that. Very true. The main criticism you'll hear about this is that the underwater scenes are slow and boring. I can't really argue that. It's fair. I would describe the pacing of this film as almost glacial in parts. Some scenes definitely feel like they're meandering around. I think that once he gets, once Bond gets to the Bahamas, it really starts to pick up. But the first 40 minutes, they are pretty slow. They have, there's some cringeworthy moments like the, you know, the, 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 the treatment of nurse fearing that we talked about. I do really like the pre-title sequence, even though that jetpack was real, it, it is kind of goofy and he only travels about like, it seemed like 150 feet on it. But that was a real jetpack that they used for the film. That was not some special effect. That worked? That was yes. a functioning jetpack? Yes, it was the very first jetpack. Wow. I will yeah. say that opening scene, uh, I don't care what happened after that point. That was the greatest opening scene I may have ever seen in a movie. Please tell us why. Because, you know, traditional Bond opening scene, there's a widow, uh, somebody who, you know, needs a little comfort from the man himself, James Bond. And and I saw the scene unfold and I said, wow, he's about to make a move on this, uh, I believe, Colonel's uh, widow. And wham, punches her straight across the face. And, you know, you find out almost immediately it's it's not a woman. It's a man in disguise. But wow, did that catch me off guard? <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely caught like it, it, my, my jaw was wide open and then I was hooked. I mean, that, that got me to sit up. <laughs> I'm so glad. And just, for, just so the listeners know, which we probably should have mentioned earlier, but whatever, uh, Ryan watched this movie for the first time mere hours ago. Yes, fresh in my mind. But yeah, once Bond gets to the Bahamas, I think things begin to move at a, at a better pace. The underwater stuff, it, it is very slow moving. At least it's good to look at from a technical perspective. I have to give it a lot of credit for basically inventing underwater cinematography. Wanted to mention as well, it's two things. The pacing, pacing like this, not uncommon for films of that era, right? Right. So yeah. film of its time. That underwater filming, it just looks beautiful, even um, seeing it in HD now. Yeah, this film looks tremendous in HD. It, it really does. You can tell watching the first four, as I know you did, Ryan, you watched them in order. You can really tell how much of a budget increase they were getting with each one. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt, it was leaps and bounds. Uh, more advanced, easier on the eye for a first-time watcher. Going back and watching a movie from the 60s, you have to take it with a grain of salt and understand you know, the time that it was released and the technology they had available. Um, so with all that in mind, yeah, it was, it was actually, I, I enjoyed it. The underwater scene's definitely slower, but with the, the kind of mentality and the, the prep talk that, that we had about how it was the first film of its kind to ever do that. I, I didn't mind it. I appreciated it for what it was. I, there is a point I wanted to make about the underwater stuff that I remember like my grandfather and my dad telling me this when I was a kid, like, you know why they were explaining to me like why they liked bond so much. And the main thing was that there was, there was just nothing like this at the time in, in, in 1965, 
James Bond was showing audiences stuff that really were completely original and unique. And there's a lot of stuff. Anton, you mentioned the, the impact that this film has had on popular culture. This film invented so many tropes, right, that, that, that Austin right. Powers and many other things have, have ripped off. But we're going to get to it a little bit later, I think, when we talk about the plot. But the concept of terrorists hijacking nuclear weapons for ransom, that had never been done before. This was the first film, or, or in this case, the novel was really the first uh, work of fiction to really explore that. I think it is worth noting. No, absolutely. And we, we joked about it before, but Austin Powers is a very obvious one. You you can't look at espionage, spy films, and not see that there was definitely tribute paid to James Bond and Thunderball. It brings back every funny thing, like the $100 million, and I'm saying that with my pinky in my mouth, like, like it, it's just so funny now having seen this for the first time, how, how badly they ripped everything off. Except it was in a more modern age, so at that point, $100 million was actually a laughable amount. <laughs> I, uh, as it comes to the editing of this film, uh, you can probably... I don't know how much you can blame this on Terrence Young effectively abandoning the, the post-production to work on another project. But this film is edited very unusually for a film of its era. It, it did force editor Peter Hunt to do this all by himself. And it is worth noting that the post-production process was done very quickly to meet that Christmas release. Hunt was not given a lot of time to work on this. And, and I, I do think it shows there is some erratic editing in here. The frenetic sped up technique, which is known as speed ramping, it does look a little dated. I think it's at odds with some of the slow pace of some of the scenes. It is one of the criticisms of this film, and I do think it. if he had had a little bit more time to work on it, I think you would have seen a little bit more of a, of a cleaner edit. You also see a lot of unorthodox editing techniques in here. There's some dissolves, there's some wipes, which is something you really don't see in a Bond film. And I was trying to research this. Anton, I think this is the only film in the series to really have dissolves and wipes. It, it's really a standout. Good call out. For me, this would be an improved film if you trimmed out five, seven, maybe up to ten minutes. You know, you don't need a lot. I think it, it just if you if you cut out just a little bit of the underwater stuff, it would have moved a lot faster. Or is it? It's the audience that's wrong. We should just soak up all of that pacing. Mm, good point. That's another way to look at it. <laughs> I remember someone told me that the way to watch the underwater scenes is just watch it at 1.2 speed. Yeah, that would work. And make the sharks bigger. I mean, come on. <laughs> Weren't big enough for you? <laughs> those, those sharks were way too small. Even I would be like, eh. Well, I mean, they were catching sharks daily to use them on this film. And I'm sure they killed some of them, unfortunately, which you can see. I don't think those um, them hitting them with the spear guns in the final battle, I don't think that was faked. Yeah, that, that did not look like they were using any prop sharks. <sighs> no, no. Well, I, I, at one point in the uh, the underwater battle, I, I think it was the underwater battle, but I noticed at some point someone shot the spear at the shark and it bounced right off of it. And yes. I was like, I wonder if that's intentional. It might have been. I know with spear fishing, you have to get a direct hit with a certain with certain fish. Like you can't hit them at an angle or it'll just glance off. I guess was what that was. Yeah. yeah. Fish are powerful. Yeah. Fish are friends, not food. Uh, they're food for me. I was going to say, it depends who you ask. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, Finding Nemo. Oh. Yes. We're going to cover the sequel on this podcast, Ryan. Finding Dory. It's coming. Mm, terrible. Terrible. You didn't, terrible. You didn't like it? No. Oh. The, Sounds I, like I, you just invited yourself to that episode, my friend. It's just a classic case of just leave it alone. Like, I get you want to make as much money as possible, but just leave it alone. You know you can't replicate that. Yep. Yeah, you just talked yourself on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was Finding Nemo, Finding Dory, then finding out what we think about the film. Yeah, wow. we're, not, we're not spoiling we're anything. I mean, Ryan spoiled it, but we're not. We're not. We're not. We're not saying nothing. No. Um, wh why don't we move to the the third reason for why this wasn't better? Yes. Pat, what did you think of the characters and the overall production of the film? I think the performances are very strong across the board. This is peak Connery as Bond. He was truly in stride at this point it's the last of that golden age for him before the whole money issue with him and eon began to bubble up connery in this film is funny charming witty completely relaxed completely confident 
He delivers all of his lines with relish. He has some great lines in this, some of my favorite of the series. When he's at Largo's place, Palmyra for lunch, and Largo asks him, do you know much about guns? He goes, no, I know a little about women. (laughs) Some men don't like to be driven. No, some men just don't like to be taken for a ride. Or maybe the best line that he has is something that he doesn't even say. When he goes into his hotel room and he finds Fiona Volpe, the femme fatale of the movie, she's in his bath. And she asks him, please get me something to put on. And he just hands her slippers. I, I fully laughed out loud when that happened. That was pretty hilarious scene. Yeah. Yeah. That was an ad lib by Connery. That was not in the script. I just love sits that. There. He's like, okay, fine. I have a towel right here. Brilliant. <laughs> um, I, one of my personal favorites. I think he got the point. Great one. Do you mind if my yeah, friend sits of- this one out? She's just dead. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of little zippy one-liners that uh, definitely made me laugh. Ryan, you're not, you're not the biggest Bond fan. What do you think of Connery in this? I, I like him. Uh, I think he fits the role well. Um, I think there's a, a, an extreme parallel. Uh, well, not an extreme parallel, but there's a, there's a big difference between uh, your latest version of Bond and this Connery version where, you know, Connery is definitely the ladies man, cool, classic, not really action packed, but he's got some skills. And then you have the the latest versions. I feel like it's just like constant explosions and fighting and shooting and beating up. And so I I prefer the Connery version of the Bond. Uh, I think it's more in line with with the image that I have of what Bond should be. So I I enjoyed the Connery version definitely uh, quite a bit. Anton, what about you? So Connery is my favorite Bond. There's so much of my own just personal enjoyment that it's hard to be to not be subjective because he's my favorite Bond. But I really just think it was a great performance. And it's hard for me to, th- to think of anyone else that could have been in that role. And I feel like that was even what fueled the future film Never Say Never Again. That they, that they were like, you know, Connery was just so good. We have to have him back in the role and pit him against... Roger Moore. So I think on that same note, I am curious, you know, um, to the both of you, do you have a personal preference for your James Bond? Connery, for sure. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Now, that being uh, said, I am a huge Roger Moore fan, and I absolutely love Brosnan as Bond, too. And I, I actually, although I am not a fan of all of his movies, I did really like Daniel Craig as Bond. I don't. He never gave a bad performance, even in a bad movie like Spectre. I would go with Pierce Brosnan. Personally, I think he had a good middle ground of the bravado charm bond with the action side of the bond that you kind of that I enjoyed. So, uh, but Connor is a strong contender uh, back of, between the two of them. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't get any Timothy Dalton's in the room. Well, <laughs> I mean, start. we're going to get to Dalton eventually. I, I like Dalton. I like his performance. I thought his two films were uneven. That's not Dalton's fault. You know, we this isn't just limited to Bond. This is this could really be explored with any actor in any role. You you can separate a performance from a movie. You do I I did it when we when the three of us last spoke about the Grinch. I don't really think right. much of that movie, but I I gave Jim Carrey all the props that he deserved for his performance in that film. Absolutely. Mm, Jim Carrey, what a legend. <laughs> but we have a that's a good maybe teaser for the future when we do come to uh to Dalton in the future. That'll be fun. Maybe Ryan will eventually get there on his journey with James Bond. <laughs> slow, slow and uh, steady wins the race on that one. You got well, time. Well, we, we've talked about Connery a lot. Uh, what were the thoughts on Blofeld and Spectre uh, in, in the film? Well, I think this is the best interpretation of it. The organization Spectre is, is presented to us as this shadowy outfit operating behind the wall of a charity in Paris, which I thought was pretty interesting. You don't really see that much into their operation, at least not, not at this point in the series. I think this is the best version of Blofeld. He works best as an unseen background supervillain pulling the strings. The on-screen versions of Blofeld, which we would, you know, we would get in the subsequent films after this, uh, I like some of them better than others, but I don't really feel that we've ever gotten a truly amazing on-screen persona of Blofeld. This is the best version of Blofeld, in my opinion. Totally agree. And we did get Spectre mentions, of course, in the previous films in the Golden Age, but I do agree with you that in this film, it really had that level of secrecy of 
one it, it felt like it was a in, in a, sh- a shrouded cloud like who is in this organization and that these guys don't mess around yeah and you know ryan was texting me this earlier how this film contains some pretty spotty audio in some scenes some of the uh dialogue some of the adr is um you know just frankly not that great mm. it doesn't match up well but i think one thing that they really got perfectly with the audio was uh, uh blofeld's voice it's very distinct, very powerful without being goofy. He's like, come in, number two, <laughs> number 11. Is that like Snape? <laughs> yeah, it's it's good. It, it's it's They don't go over the top with it. They play it pretty straight. And, of course, you know the boardroom scene where the guy gets fried in the chair, that was something that, of course, has been parodied countless times, most famously, obviously, by Austin Powers. But it wasn't a cliche back then. Are they going to reuse that chair? You have to wonder. I mean, it's pretty. pretty <laughs> it it gross looked like at that it point. was kind of unusable after that. Yeah, the so leather why, looked why a little frayed. Come, why have it come back up? Yeah, they're yeah. Uh, they're dropping that off at Goodwill after. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish for Blofeld. Maybe this is just a me thing, but put a mask on him. Why Why do you have him hanging in the air where you can't really see his face? Like a, a mask would serve, no? Yeah, I mean, because like you got to figure everyone's sitting at the boardroom table they could just look under the screen right like yeah they, it's for the so audience it's nothing more just want to peek real quick and and is it pretty on the nose that daniel craig specter basically used this as the inspiration for the scene in the same film yeah and they did a far worse version of it but terrible they, but hey just, they were trying stupid. to imitate they were trying to imitate the original yeah they, so they were which was, which was great it's just a stupid movie <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I gave that a D plus initially. That's just not not even close. Because I gave The Grinch. A D- I was thinking about The Grinch, actually, when I was like, I gave The Grinch a D plus. I was like, that's a better movie than Spectre. I felt like you were a little harsh on The Grinch. I feel like I was justified. I thought we were in C's get degrees territory on The Grinch. I mean, I I could I can round it up for you like 69.5. No, 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 no. It's, you know, <laughs> no, couldn't couldn't possibly ask that. No, like, no, I won't. I won't. Did Spectre <laughs> ask for enough money? Yeah, million. It's about a billion dollars today. I thought they weren't being that greedy. Well, you have to find that middle ground where it's reasonable, right? Right. Uh, can can you wrestle up a billion dollars amongst all the world powers? Surely, and in quick timing, sure. And you could probably do a lot with the billion dollar equivalent at the time. And then, you know, it's not like well, uh, we promise once you pay us out, we'll never do crime anymore. So just give us that <laughs> one. So you know, it's a good. It's a good thing to kind of line the coffers a little bit with a, your, your quick uh, payday and then go from there. How do you come up with a good strategy of if this is like the typical thing that the organization does, which is take the world hostage, maybe not doing it in one big sum at a time. If they know that they can get away with it, let's just see. All right, let's just test out. If we can do a hundred million, maybe we, maybe we take the world hostage again, but let's see how we do here and then kind of build up uh, for, for more and more in the future because no one's going to be able to catch us. Respect her. It wasn't typical, and I think that's one of the best parts of the exposition that they establish. I don't know if you caught this line. It was real quick, but it re- they, they said right at the beginning of the boardroom scene, this is our most ambitious project. We've been planning this for two years. So this is like they had clearly been building up to this for a long, long time. And to your point, I think they were really smart to not ask for too much. Yeah, their, yeah. their other project was putting fluoride in the water. I mean, they got the one guy had, what, 250,000 pounds? Come on. What are you even doing there? Yeah, he did. He didn't ask for enough. No. <laughs> well, they, they remember on. they originally they were only going to give him a hundred grand, and then he asked for more, and that's why yeah. they killed him. I mean, they were probably going to kill him anyway because they're bad guys. True, they were bad guys, but that was I, I liked how they did that scene. Uh, I mean, you could figure out pretty quickly how they did it, but uh, I I did like the the kind of fake uh, duplicate man. Yeah, like it's not a realistic in, in interpretation of plastic surgery, but again, easy to understand. And this is why you really need to watch Never Say Never Again, because they get goofy with it. <laughs> yeah, they try to go a little too complex with it. I'll give like you a little they- preview, Ryan. There's a quote from that film. His left eye is an exact duplicate of the president of the United States. <laughs> All right, I, I, I'll bite. I'll bite. Yeah, it's as confusing as you think it is. Yeah, yeah It's on HBO know. Max right now. Okay. Uh, it's just Max, though, please. Oh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. How yeah, could I? Th- that disrespects the whole organization if you just call it HBO Max. Yeah. Right. Heaven forbid. <laughs> I really like that aircraft that they landed, the, the Vulcan. Pretty cool looking plane. 
Welcome to school. The underwater yeah. light thing, whatever the hell that yeah. was, was Turn awful. on the underwater landing lights. That was, I, I was like, whoa, they put a platform in the middle of the ocean. That's so cool. That's actually a cool idea. And then, you know, the lights from the the viewpoint of the cockpit was terrible. But I was like, I could forgive this. And then I realized he's just landing in water. Mm. Which is possible, as we yeah. know from the miracle on the Hudson. Yes, true. That's a great point, except he forgot to flip it upside down. But whatever, we'll, we'll let that one slide. Um, and then, what, you know, you put the landing gear out for the underwater uh, drop off was kind of weird. It was cool. They they basically built a full size replica of the plane and just sunk it. That's the only way they could do stuff like that back then. You know, it was obvious when uh, Connery was swimming into the cockpit at the one point. And if you pay attention, it, it was about half of his height. Uh, the door that he went into. <laughs> it made me <laughs> chuckle. I was like, "Yeah, this is definitely a tiny little replica, isn't it?" Handle like eggs. Yeah. What the hell is that? I feel like that's I mean, good advice when dealing with nuclear weapons, right? I, I wonder, you have to wonder, because I've obviously never seen a nuclear weapon before, but do they have to put like those types of uh, idiot proof warnings like they do on the McDonald's coffee, like warning hot? Uh, <laughs> do you, do they have to put those legally on, on nukes, you know, just to cover I, I their own know. butts? I don't know. If any of our listeners know, please write in and tell us. Handle like eggs. <laughs> Speaking of the, the main bad guy of this film, Emilio Largo. Adolfo Celli. I really like him. Absolutely. Kills it. I was it. a fan. He's yeah. a great villain. He's yeah, intelligent. I, he's calculating. I love how much of a hands-on villain he is. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty with just about anything. He's also really charming. Seems like a really nice guy. You know, maybe. If he wasn't kinda. a super villain. Yeah. Yeah. If you could put that aside for a minute, for sure. I think yeah, he seemed I mean, like a... He's so affable of a host. When Bond uh, visits him for lunch, like he's he's like genuinely excited to have Bond there as his guest. I, I just love the the hospitality. It, it was strange. But yes, please sleep with my girlfriend. Take her out for uh, <laughs> uh, Wanagoo Festival. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I'll, I'll see you later. His niece, mistress, whatever kind of thing they were doing there. So were they were they saying that she was the niece because it was the, the big age difference? It's easier to describe it that way. I, I don't understand where the niece thing played in. Well, I'll, I'll blow your mind in a different way. Uh, there really wasn't a much much of an age difference. Uh, Adolfo Celli was only 43 when he filmed this movie. <laughs> wow. He's 43 years old. Yeah, plus a couple, maybe 20. Yeah. Oh, I don't She. I, yeah, I guess maybe it was kind of a bad age difference. I don't know. Whatever. I mean, no, no. It, 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 I, I was saying for his age, that guy was pushing 60. He looked like it, yeah. Yeah, but. Look, I'm just going by what Wikipedia tells me. Like it, it, I find it very hard to believe he was only 43, but people, they lived harder back then. There's no doubt. Well, and I, mean, I, he, I think he dyed his hair white. I think his hair was naturally dark brown, which probably makes a huge difference. Maybe it was all the sunburn that threw me off. <laughs> they, they were crispy. <laughs> he was so red the entire time. I'm just like, geez, man. At some point, you'd expect him to tan over, but no. Connery, too, for a, a Scotsman, pretty tan. Yes. I love the uh, the casino scene in here, which we already touched on, Anton, the Baccarat. It's just so classy. Right. It's one of the classiest casino scenes in the whole series. It's interesting because while the game is very simple, it does. it's really only in more recent years that it's become more popular, so people even actually know how the game is played. I certainly didn't know how the game was played when I was a kid uh, no. seeing that film for the first time. But now knowing how one wins, it's just, it makes it all that much more satisfying when Largo is like flips his cards. I got eight, thinks it's a guaranteed win, but Bond has a nine. Yeah, the only one thing that could beat him. I mean, it's a game of chance, bro, right? Like, it, yeah, I absolutely. guess from the gambling perspective, you can play the odds uh, based on the shoe. But in, in the sense of how they played it, where, you know, you're either the bank or the player, it's really just uh, dumb luck. You know, Bond has to win that out. Bunko. Yeah, I watched this movie so many times as a kid and just had no idea how that game was played. I'm like, yeah, this looks cool. I don't understand it, but just get a nine. That's it. Right. Get a nine every time. Simple I as wish that. people would dress like this in casinos today. They're just everyone's in a suit or a tux or some classy dress. It's it's fantastic. I think what's tough with even dressing like that in casinos in Vegas, of course, is how freaking hot it gets. But I guess there really there shouldn't be any excuses. They're playing in the Bahamas. 
True. I think yeah. people just dressed far better than not even close. The attire nowadays is what the white undershirt and a gold chain. Yeah. Uh, Anton, I will have you know I was in a suit and tie the entire time that I was in Las Vegas the last time. Well, I'll see you I'll see you there and we'll and we'll 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 wear suits when we go out. Damn right we will. And we'll hit the, the, the back rat table. Yes, as long as we can find the ten dollar minimum. That's fine. <laughs> we'll have to go forty miles off the strip. No, our aria, eight AM. <laughs> There we go. We'll, we'll get coffee first. Just even thinking about that scene from the film, there's a lot there where you can interpret it in so many different ways. And it just, it, it's great because one, you know, Ryan, you made the point, it's a game of chance. So in a way it's Bond saying my odds are better than yours. They both know the situation. Um, Largo knows who Bond is. Bond, of course, knows Largo. So it they're very, like, very much, it's whoever can get the better edge of the other. So Bond is essentially saying, my odds are better than I'm going to get get you at the end of this. And the other side of it is, out of all casino games, um, or at least casino card games, not a lot of table games let you actually touch the cards, right? Like when you play Blackjack, mm-hmm. you're not allowed to touch the cards. Right. Backrad is one of the rare games where... Um, they actually give the cards to the players to reveal what cards that they have. It's just part of like the, the culture of the game. So again, there's another example of Bond showing his hand, showing that his that his odds are in his hands and he's going to be able to come up in the end. So I thought it was just all very cool stuff with the scene. I, I was waiting to see if he uh, if he had an x-ray eye under his uh, eye patch. I didn't know <laughs> if that was part of this film too. So uh no. Maybe a little disappointed to learn that he was just playing a normal casino game. Oh, that's what's, why he what's, lost. What's funny with it too is uh, just nowadays, uh, gamblers playing that game, you can you can bet on a tie with Baccarat. So of course, how crazy would it be if there was like other the other people at the table? Bond reveals, oh, I have an eight as well, and someone's like, I just won ten to one on my bet because <laughs> I bet on the tie. Uh, I always uh, think of that uh, movie, The Big Short. Yes. Where they're all yeah. betting on the, <laughs> the blackjack hands. Yes. <laughs> Connery is just oozing confidence at that Baccarat table. Just oh, yeah. tossing the cards down. Eight, nine. I mean, just, you have to imagine yeah. he's playing with uh, government money at that point, so I would be too. She sure. was. Um, one of the things from the novels is that he is not well paid salary wise, but whenever he's on a mission, he has an unlimited expense account, which is pretty sweet. Yeah. Why not then? At that point, yeah. Raise the stakes, bud. Let's go. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about the other cool part of this movie. Is this the best looking lineup of women in any Bond movie or possibly any movie? First off, I love my wife. Um, yeah, we're yes. being, yeah, yeah. Know, this is just an honest discussion. Yes, they're very beautiful women. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I think we, we said it earlier, kind of the, I don't know if you want to call it misogyny, but the, the, the need to have a, a well endowed woman like, you're in the Bahamas for a big chunk of this film. You're underwater for a huge chunk of this film. Like they have all of the women in bathing suits pretty much constantly. So they, they knew what they were doing with this and they went for uh, a lot of very attractive women. I, I think they, they had to at that point. Yeah. They did an amazing job with who they selected as Domino. They did. Yeah. She is obviously incredible looking, Claudine Auger. She's one of the most popular Bond girls of the entire series. It's easy to see why. I think her performance is pretty good. Yeah. She she has like an actual character arc, you know, with, with, with what happens with her brother and the way Largo is treating her. Like she has an actual personality and I I haven't really seen her in anything else. And she didn't really have much of a career after this. I'm not really sure why. I think her performance is really good. Yeah. I, I feel like she could have definitely uh, vaulted off of this performance. Her and Volpe looked a lot alike, though. Uh, they did it, it, until yeah. it was like fully established it was who Luciana I'm like, Wait, Paluzzi. <laughs> why is she driving so fast what, what's Domino's rush right now and then oh, I'm like Fiona. oh yeah, well, yeah so I thought it was Domino for a second I'm like <laughs> why what is she doing she's being kind of weird and I'm like wait that's the other one oh never mind she has incredible con- uh, chemistry with Connery yeah she is a fan she she might be the best female villain of the entire series she's fantastic mm-hmm Fiona Volpe, great name too. So I'm 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 curious if the Pat, do you know if there's a version of this film that includes scenes with the original voiceovers for Domino, Largo, and and uh I forget that there was a third character that was also dubbed, but 
both oh, Domino that's, and that's, Volpe. That's all the Bond movies in the 60s, yeah. man. There's just yeah. ADR all over. I don't think so. I'd watch it. I'd for sure watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's curious. Yeah, because there's a, a lot of people are dubbed. Yeah, the dub the dubbing was where I was a little pro- probably my most critical piece of this was the dubbing. Like uh, there was just a few points where, I mean, it's not even like it didn't line up quite right, but there would be points where the character in the film is speaking, but there's no uh, voice coming out. It, it's just it was it was pretty. I was like, oh, that's kind of sloppy. Uh, like, like Pat said, though, it was it was very commonplace in films back then. I've watched these films so much that I, it's gotten to the point where I'm able to tell they basically use the same six people to dub various characters. And you can hear the same voices in like Dr. No from Russia with Love. This one, it's like that's the same voice <laughs> of the, the boat captain from Dr. No. We'll be back with the dogs. <laughs> Just park the car over there. Did either and of we, you spot the portable rebreather that George Lucas would later steal for the Jedi in Phantom Menace? Yes, I did. That's so fun. <laughs> so great. Funny anecdote about that re They were approached by what I believe was a representative of the CIA after the film because they wanted to know how the production designers designed it. And, of course, they were just holding their breath. So, <laughs> I, just, I just love the idea of just men in suits go to a studio exec's office how how did they design this how how did they build this can we talk about that and the jetpack please uh could you just put something on the schedule this was the first bond filmed in panavision i think the cinematography is one of the best things about it very colorful film and this is really one of the the movies where i saw this so many times as a kid on tv where you know it just mm-hmm. basically chops off two sides of the actual picture so seeing this on a proper tv it's like seeing it for the first time it's gorgeous so yeah seeing it um in hd for the rewatch it was just stunning and and really was why watching the underwater scenes i was like this is amazing yeah almost 60 years old it looks great Great location usage. The Bahamas looks amazing. I forgot it was still a British colony in 1965. That's how old this movie is. Yeah, the underwater battle at the end, the climax between the Navy and Spectre, it's pretty awesome. Bond slicing his way through the mayhem. There's there's air hoses getting cut. There's spears getting fired left and right. Also, I think pretty cool. We haven't talked about the music yet, but when the battle begins, there's no music. It's really a great use of scoring by John Barry. He knew just when to use the music yeah. and when to hold back. And yeah, Anton, it's a- great. It's great spatial geography. None of the action in this scene is confusing. You you get a proper sense <laughs> yes. of where everyone is. The good guys are wearing orange. The bad guys are wearing black. There's a mix of overhead shots. And it's, it's very easy to tell what's going on. Are, are we giving another film any side eye as we, as we talk about this? Oh, the ne- yes, of course. The next film that we're just discussing, the remake, Never Say Never Again, the terrible use of spatial geography. Yeah, um, Ryan, at the end of that movie in the final battle, it's a bunch of guys in black wetsuits fighting a bunch of other guys in black wetsuits. Yeah, so hard to keep up who's supposed yeah, to be it's killing just, who. It, and I mean, for as white... old as this film is, I would put this final battle up against a lot of modern action stuff. I think it's really aged well. It's well shot, well edited, very mm-hmm. thrilling to watch. There's real tension in it because, of course, they have to get to the nuke before Miami's destroyed. Very original yeah. finale, too. I can't even imagine how hard that would be to film, right? A lot of take. Yeah. It, yeah, it they did a great job out. with it. I, 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 I like the action of the scene, for sure. I, I don't understand why they had this big uh, underwater battle. Why not just uh, board the ship and stop it from there? Well, they had the bomb on that one underwater sled. Yeah, but they were bringing it to the ship, no? That was the whole no, point. No, they were like, bringing it to Miami to, to blow it up. But I, I thought that's why Bond said, let me know when the nuke is on the ship. Like, they were going to transport it from wherever it was to the ship and then do it. What do you do with the nuke? How do you launch it from? You can't just. I don't know. Do you just like set a timer on it and it explodes? Maybe yeah, I don't know. They were know. just going to detonate it, and there was two bombs. Remember? Yeah, both yeah, of they them. Were, they were. Like they were. They were just going to blow it up, and then after the <laughs> Navy captured the one, Largo went back to the Disco Volante to get the other one. Okay. All right. Maybe then that makes more sense. I was a little confused. Like, hey, why not? just go straight to the ship and then you don't have to have this crazy underwater battle which everyone was just 
very well prepared for an underwater battle. It was astonishing. <laughs> it created this this jetpack underwater uh, spear gun crazy device for you have at it. Yeah, I like when Q gives him all the gear. He might as well have said, like, just in case, 007, <laughs> pay attention. Just in case you get into a giant underwater battle, use this. <laughs> Yeah, it was just, it seemed very uh, specific purpose for that uh, piece of equipment, but thank goodness uh, he had it. Now, the final fight on board the Disco Volante, I think it's exciting, but this is probably the weak link in the movie with all the speed ramping, the special mm-hmm. effects. It's it's pretty dated. Oh, it's terrible. That speed boat-esque yeah. type of, yeah, the, the speed ramp, that was, that was painful. It's not great. It does have one of the funniest things in the entire series, though, which is the henchman delivering champagne in the middle of the fight. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, it's like uh, Largo is trying to drive his yacht into Miami to basically destroy an entire city. And he's like, but I need champagne delivered at some point during this. <laughs> yeah. Pretty great timing. And then the movie just kind of ends pretty abruptly. They get the skyhook deal, which whisks him and Domino away. I, I guess the guy that took the fuse out and help Domino. I guess he just drowns because they don't really show what happened to him. Oh, well. Yeah, he's yeah, drowned. Drowned yeah. is good. The Skyhook was cool. The Skyhook was cool. That was a real thing. It would later make an appearance in The Dark Knight, if you yeah. remember. Yep. Mm-hmm. No, I, I enjoyed that, actually. I thought that was really cool. What did we think of the music? Oh, come on now. It was amazing. It, it was, that's, that's, just a, 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 that's just a soft underhand pitch for the home run that this was one of the best of the series. Yeah, it's memorable. It's bombastic. It's got a, you know, a, a lot of great different cues. It's probably the only reason why I, I tolerate the underwater scenes is because they're all scored so beautifully. And I do love the title song. It's a banger. What do you think, Ryan? I don't know if you're on board with the music like we are. No, I, I definitely am. It's very Bond-esque. Um, it's well used. I think you pointed out that, that, you know, for the underwater scene, I like how it wasn't, uh, they didn't rely on the music to build the uh, climax or action. Like, they kind of used it as a supplement, and, and it helped the scenes. Uh, I was definitely a fan of the music in this. I do want to give a shout out to the wardrobe because we can't yes. talk about a Bond movie without talking about the clothes. This is one of the best in the series. All the stuff he's wearing, for the most part, pretty timeless. You get a nice mix of suits and casual wear. Pretty much everything that he wears in the Bahamas is how I dress in the summer. Solid color linen shirts, linen trousers, slip on shoes. Pretty timeless. And I do want to give a shout out to Royale Filmware. Because they do a great job of making stuff that you see in the Daniel Craig films. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that they expand to some of the older films, like 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 Thunderball. Mm-hmm. I personally own a couple different items from them. And to all of our listeners, if you like what you see in the Daniel Craig era in terms of the clothes, Royale Filmware is your best bet for finding high quality, not replicas, but they're, they're, it's really like high quality tailoring that's based on stuff that you see in the film, like that Skyfall peacoat. I own that. I own the linen blazer from Spectre, the linen trousers and the tropical shirt from Casino Royale, the Matera jacket from No Time to Die. I have all of these things from Royale Filmware. I wear them regularly. It's great stuff, and I just wanted to give them a shout-out. We've definitely mentioned them before in this podcast, but I I really wanted to give Royale an official shout-out, Anton, just because of how great their stuff is. And um, Daniel, who runs the show for that company, he is a listener. Awesome. That's cool. Connected with him on Instagram, and he he is a listener. So I I wanted to give him and his company uh, a shout-out. Fantastic. No, totally agree. Hopefully, we get to see in the near future some uh, golden golden age era bond outfits connery rocks the rolex i noticed he does he also wears a brightling in this film that is the oh. only appearance of brightling in the james bond series that dive watch that he wears that's a guy get counter that is yep. a brightling true okay good, good point good point we can start to wrap this up anton but i had a a quote i wanted to share with you uh shortly before the release of this film sean connery gave an interview with Playboy magazine. It's in print. You can read it online. It's very lengthy. It's very in-depth. He was very candid. He provides a pretty intelligent perspective on the series in general. Connery said about the future of the uh, franchise after this, quote, 
It's a healthy market and and it has been maintained because each succeeding film has got bigger and the gimmicks trickier. But we have to be careful where we go next because I think with Thunderball, we've reached the limit as far as size and gimmicks are concerned. Continued. So all the gimmicks now have been done and they are expected. What is needed now is a change of course. Continued. More attention to character and better dialogue. End quote. So you can kind of see why he grew disillusioned with the next film, You Only Live Twice. He wanted a more character-centric, plot-heavy approach, and the producers took things in the opposite direction. They, they jumped the shark with You Only Live Twice. Right. Now, I like You Only Live Twice, even though it's pretty goofy. But I thought that interview that he gave is really interesting. I, I love that quote and just how self-aware uh, Connery is. And it's not surprising just how how committed to his craft he is how committed he is to and how much he cares and like you said pat when he doesn't you can tell but damn if he doesn't still put up a good performance yeah even when he's uh, checked out he's still funny he's got bravado swag he definitely does we were talking about him before ryan but like i've never really seen an actor like him he's he's just one of a kind yeah he's definitely unique he's got his own style and and it's just it, it works. Whatever he's playing, it works. That's it for the reasons of why Thunderball wasn't better. You know, the treatment of women in the film, the pacing, the editing, the characters, the production. Ryan, as you're the guest and we give our ratings, we, we talk about whether or not we like the film. Would you like to go first? Yeah, I'll go first on this one. I think overall, like I said, and, and we touched on this, I offer a unique perspective in that I have never seen it prior. I had not seen it prior to today. Um, so I lose a bit of the nostalgia factor, right? The the memories of watching it with family or when I was younger and kind of opening my eyes to like, wow, this is so incredible to see. Um, but even with that, going back, looking at it, it it's a good film. It, it is a good film. Uh, I like the story out of the four Bond film, uh, Bond films I recently watched, the Connery or Connery era films. This was my favorite by far. Um, the, the opening scene itself was enough to that juice the score. I'm going to be honest, that, that made me laugh so hard, but there was just a lot of stuff that I really did enjoy in this. There were some things where I'm like, ah, speed ramping, not for me. Uh, I don't think, they, I don't think that was a great touch, but I, I understand, you know, they had some issues at the end with post-production. So I give them a pass on that, but, uh, would I watch it again? Maybe down the line, who's to say, but, uh, Overall, I think the rating I would give this would be a B minus. Pretty good. Anton, would you like me to go or would you want to? Oh, I'm happy to go. So I, I, t- I, I mentioned it a bit earlier, but it's, you know, Connery is my favorite Bond. And this film is from the golden era for, for Bond films. And it's just so great to be able to revisit, watch it in HD, which I haven't, I hadn't seen it in HD so it really felt like, you know, Pat, you said it best. It felt like watching it for the first time. And while there is definitely some more problematic aspects that don't really um, still sit very well, there's so much about this film that just like that I love and that objectively are very good. And I think one of those things just, again, really is just very strong, simple plot that is driven by this colorful world building amazing characters and performances that really bring it to life you can and this is a great example of you can have a very simple story but at the same time the execution is really able to bring it to life so a fantastic film from that perspective and the box office shows it that being able to have a film that really brings that all together just is receptive and at the same time a great recipe for success from my perspective i think that uh they don't make it like this anymore there there are too many films try to imitate but they can never quite get the same magic but yeah it, it is very clear that this has had so much influence on not even just uh spy and espionage films but all reaches of popular culture so that being said i've said enough about how great i think this film is i'm gonna go ahead and just say my rating is an a minus this is not perfect but thunderball has a lot of the classical bond elements and it, it does them extremely well memorable villain Great women, exotic location, a straightforward plot, amazing music, and an all-time performance for Connery. This is peak Connery. 
it suffers from slow pacing in parts, and there's some really dated stuff in it with how the women are treated. But I do think overall it is one of the best bonds, and it, it is the textbook definition of the term classic bond. And last but not least, it looks absolutely spectacular. I have this ranked in my top 10 favorite Bond movies. I rated an A minus like you, Anton. I think quite, quite highly of Thunderball. I rewatch this one fairly frequently. I don't know how many times I've seen it, but it's, it's a really good Bond movie to just either sit down and watch with a cocktail or just put it on in the background with whatever you want to do. If you're cooking or whatnot, this is a great one to throw on. This was the last of the first four Bonds, the core four, if you will, not just because Connery was in them, but because of what they represented in terms of how they chose to address the storytelling in these first four and then going forward. This is really the last time that the series was not self-aware. By this point, it was really a global f- phenomenon. And after Thunderball, the producers knew that going forward, they had to meet fan expectations. They had established the Bond formula. And they would have to continue to check the boxes like, oh, well, it can't be a Bond movie without locations, girls, a type of villain, cars, gadgets, music, et cetera, et cetera. With the first four films, you could almost make a case they didn't know what they were doing. Now, I'm not implying that they were incompetent. In fact, the opposite. They were trailblazing. The first four films were so fresh and creative that for the rest of the series, each subsequent film that came after this would only be calling back to this and the early ones. Every film going forward features some kind of reference or throwback to these first four. It's a misnomer to think of all you know, the Bond series as all one type of film. Starting with the very next one, You Only Live Twice, the, you, um, the series would move into a bigger, more uh, whimsical, more self-aware era, and then it would only grow from there. That's my final thought on Thunderball. Fantastic. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us again. I, yes, I, I had you, no idea how you were going to rate this film, and I was so curious to have you on as, as a basically a, a new Bond viewer. Yeah, I, I appreciate you having me. This was a, uh, maybe challenge isn't the right word, but it pushed me to watch something that otherwise I probably would have gotten to eventually in life, but uh, I don't know when. So I, I appreciated that. And uh, I, honestly, like I said, there was a lot of good, and I did enjoy the film. Uh, from a unique perspective, I would say. So I hope I don't get canceled, cultured by the, the Bond <laughs> aficionados for, for my rating. Oh, so I, you I, couldn't I possibly. It. Well, we'll have to have you back soon. Yeah, Saving Dory, Finding Dory. <laughs> <laughs> saving, saving Private, private Dory. Private Dory, yeah. Saving <laughs> Private Dory, I forgot that one. That was a, a, harrowing, a harrowing tale of World War II underwater action. <laughs> That's the pinnacle of underwater film right there. This summer, a new Pixar film goes to war. That is it for Thunderball. The viewers can expect part two of this unofficial double header in just a couple of days with uh, Never Say Never Again, which is a remake of this film, Thunderball. And that will be it, Anton, for our final episodes of 2023. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. What a year. What yeah. a year. That'll be 49 episodes in less than 10 months. Not bad. Workhorse is the two of you. Can I make a bold prediction, by the way? Let's go. Of course. I think the reason that there's such a lag between Bond films is because Eon is, uh, Barbara Broccoli is holding out and selling uh, the studio to uh, Kyle Cauliflower and his family. <laughs> and they're going to they're gonna the, take it in a different direction. The Cauliflowers. <laughs> yeah, the Cauliflowers will be the next uh, Bond owners. That's that's my bold prediction. Well, you, you know how the vegetable wars have been going. Not great. Yeah. Well, that's Destructive. True. Yeah. A lot of a lot of but, folks getting cooked. Yeah. Ashley Asparagus <laughs> has been making a play. Uh, oh, that is it for Thunderball. We will see you next time when we talk about Never Say Never Again. Take care, everyone. Uh,